Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here with uh, Jose Andres and this great audience. And we're going to talk about lots of stuff, but I've got to start with uh, the other day, throwing out the ball at the game. What was that like? Yeah. Anybody I mean, watch? This is the, this is the health Any, anybody summit, Anybody rooting right? for the Nats? Anybody rooting for the Nats? So, uh, can you believe this was my second time in three weeks in a baseball field? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's to laugh. First time, I was, I was landing in a helicopter in Bahamas. And the second time, I was throwing a pitch on the World Series. Is your shoulder bothering you? And bit? I'm happy I'm at the health summit because I injured myself <laughs> with that pitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I barely made it. Uh, but anyway, did you, and practice, Zimmerman, did you uh, practice for that? Did you yeah, warm up for that? Yeah, I have so many friends, everybody. I had like 100 friends coaching me. And they all came with their children, and now they are all bragging that they trained me. So I didn't say no to anybody, but that means only that my arm is really destroyed. <laughs> uh, next time I'm going to learn to say no or bring all of them at once and train me together. Because I went through 100 trainings with 100 different <laughs> friends, and this was brutal. And that was, that was a fastball, yeah. a curveball? What was that? Yeah. The what? What you do? <laughs> uh, 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 I did a curveball. Yeah, I had other, other opportunities, but I, I settled for that one. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I had other options, but I thought I took the right decision. I, yeah. Curveballs are appropriate for Washington. Um, so <laughs> I, we're thrilled you're here. I've had the opportunity to work with Jose Andres before, not to mention dine in his amazing restaurants, not to mention completely admire the work that he does around the world, and that's some of what we want to talk about here, um, certainly with World Central Kitchen. But could you, could you just tell people, how did you go from food I want to cook and restaurants to this very big play you're doing in humanitarian work? Uh, I think it was something natural. Uh, when I moved to D.C. Uh, 26 years ago, Haleo opened across the street from Clara Barton, Missing Soldier's Office. Clara Barton, the woman that founded the Red Cross. Clara Barton, the woman that took care of the wounded soldiers during the Civil War. Clara Barton, the person that single-handed created the system to bring in um, uh, uh, medicine and to bring in a uh, response to all the wounded soldiers. So I thought my mom and my dad were nurses. Hospital for me was my playground, because one worked in the AM, the other worked in the PM, so they were exchanging us in the hospital. So I, I, for me, nurses always was uh, 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 people that I saw that they went the extra mile. When I realized about the power of Clara Barton and having my restaurant across the street, I was very, very impressed by learning of her story. And I thought if a woman like this did what she did with almost nothing, um, white cooks like me, we cannot provide the same uh, in this case, food in moments. So, uh, so, that's so, the so you started, but you yep. started small and local with that? Program. Well, I began in DC, probably you know DC Central Kitchen, Robert Egger, uh, 30 years ago, he founded this organization, taking homeless out of the street, um, making sure that people will not be wasted, giving them opportunity to belong. Um, and also he saw that food was being wasted. He put everything together, began training the homeless in cooking, so restaurants like me, we can hire them after they graduated, and at the same time, producing over 10,000 meals a day for the hungry population, the homeless population in Washington, D.C. Robert Erger told me that charity seems is always about the redemption of the giver, when actually should be about the liberation of the receiver. Mm. If we don't put this in our forehead and we don't start liberating the receiver, whatever we do to help others is really not so effective. We need to start helping others, understanding that we are there to liberate them from whatever we want to help them to so, move on. So walk us through, walk us through the, the growth of World Central Kitchen. We'll get to what it's doing and what it's done, but I mean, it's really an incredible thing now. I mean, it's got a global reach, and you're everywhere with it, which is amazing. But you've got all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. 
Well, today was a good day because we were doing a board. I'm terrible on boards. I should be kicked out of every board. I'm I the bet worst. You bring a certain. No, no. I only bring good food to the board. Um, I, I usually am the opening chairman, and then they fire me a month later. Um, and I'm, it's the happiest day of my life. Uh, and <laughs> it's like I hate those meetings. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but we today, uh, Robert, uh, Nate Mook, who is executive director, and myself, and Nate and I, we've been going to many of the big ones, like Puerto Rico, two years ago. We were here in D.C. As we have teams that they reach Sunday, 1.5 million meals in Bahamas. We have three kitchens in California, taking care of every single area of the fires. We responded in the tornado in Dallas. We are in Venezuela. We are in Colombia. We're in Guatemala. We're in Haiti. We're in Puerto Rico. And today is the first day I, after 10 years that we found it. It was in Kitchen after the earthquake in Haiti, in Port au Prince. The first day that I'm like, man, we are really building something great. Doesn't need of us. We are, I didn't call it Jose Andres Foundation. I call it World Central Kitchen. Some of the best chefs in California, they are cooking right now, feeding first responders, firefighters, and every single person in the family in the shelters. And today gave me a lot of pride to see that this organization is here to stay, is here to provide meals and relief to people. But especially, I just came back from Bahamas, and the Bahamas operation, I was uh, so proud of how the team responded. We arrived 12 days before UN, and this is no criticism of UN, and 12 days before USAID. The organization was not supposed to be there by the time any one of the big organizations arrives, we were doing 45,000 meals a day in 13 different islands. And now, to, to deploy those people that fast to do, you know, 13 different islands, that's a logistical miracle, really, to, especially to go into disaster relief like that. So do you have plans on the wall that you can just pull? Do you no. have volunteers that you just say, go? How do you, how do you move that quickly when others can't? We, we, we embrace complexity. We, organizations, private or nonprofit or, gover or government, sometimes we plan so much and for so long, and the plans go into folders that every time they're bigger, that at the end when you finish the plan, you forgot where you put the folder that is supposed to tell you what you are supposed to do. <laughs> so I don't want to sound here uh, smart, ASS. I, we don't plan. We don't meet. We say that we go with boots on the ground as soon as we can. In, 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 in Dorian, in the Bahamas, we landed on Monday as the hurricane was still above Grand Bahama. But, but who, is, who is we? I mean, where, who are all these people? Where are they, are they, this isn't a fire station where you call in and they jump Ten, down. 10% them. of the workforce of America is in food business. I have the entire army of the 10% of America ready to join us. That's what we created. When everybody is used trying to plan, we cannot move in because we don't have fuel. I had fuel. Every single ship in the middle of the road with siphon into the cars. In 24 hours, we had eight cars. They were broken. They looked like Mad Max. But we had cars. We got one helicopter from Haiti because no other were available because they were in Fort Lauderdale and because the hurricane was moving in, we couldn't have the helicopters coming in. So we got one from Haiti coming from behind the hurricane. They didn't got permission from the Bahamian government. I went to the palace where the prime minister is. He's the nicest guy. I got the permit from the prime minister to get landing permits to bring the helicopter. I told him, it's very simple. We're here to feed you people. If I don't have tools, I cannot do it. We went from one helicopter to six helicopters, two seaplanes, one ship with two helipads, multiple cars. We built a dock. We delivered hundreds of uh, generators. We delivered 10 water sal desalination systems. Uh, we evacuated 40 people, medical evacuations. I was so proud of that. At the end, what we did was simple. What do we need to provide meals to people? We need helicopters, we got them. We needed the boat, we got it. We got the team in Nassau, we got the team in, Free in, in Fort Lauderdale. From Fort Lauderdale, we attacked at Freeport. From Nassau, we attacked at Marsh Harbor. Before we knew, we were all across the, the, the 13 islands. 
And at the end, we need to remember one thing. The very big problems we face, they have very simple solutions. And sometimes the solution doesn't happen in a meeting room. The solution happens when you are with the boots on the ground, seeing in first person what the people actually need. That's the way to do it. I, I, just, I just want to share some numbers with you so you have some idea, and maybe you already do because your, your, your project is, is, is very well known, World Central Kitchen, but um, you've, you've served, World Central Kitchen has served more than 10 million meals um, and over, through over 44,000 volunteer shifts around the world. How about this, 3.7 meals in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, 500,000 meals um, in Guatemala after the Fuego um, volcano eruption. Just in North Carolina, 300,000 meals after hur Hurricane Florence. In California, 400,000 meals after multiple wildfires. And just to show that you're a true humanitarian, he served 100,000 meals here in Washington, D.C. when we had a government shutdown. Uh, now, as you decide where to go, is it no plan, emergency, we go? Or is there a strategy to this? Because there are a lot of needy places in the world. Well. Obviously, we, we need to be careful because uh, 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 the funds we have are the funds we have, but we don't look to the bank account of the NGO to react to where we need to go. So just we go, and, and we hope that we'll pay by donations of people. The vast majority of our donations are one, two, three dollar donations, and that's how that we covers do it. Your, that covers your cost? Ah, that covers quotes. Your donation. But I don't, quite frankly, I'm not very good at numbers. Uh, I hope the CFO has that control. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't even belong to the organization. I'm just the founder. I, uh, nobody listens to anything I have to say anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, so obviously that's serious, but uh, a lot of people sometimes they will, I, I, we, 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 we became like, like, we tell people in real time what's happening. It's a lot of big NGOs, they cannot do that because they have a hard time even proving they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. We communicated for two reasons. You know the happiness that gives you when you know you come back from a little island called Green Turtle, okay, or Man of War, north of Abaco. And the first video any of the family members of those people is the videos that we post on social media, them telling all their family members we are alive. Nobody has died. We are okay. Don't worry for us. World Central Kitchen is taking care of us. This gives me the biggest joy. Sometimes I repeat, what we do is fairly, fairly simple. Uh, sometimes certain big organizations, they claim that we are a little bit not a teamwork. And teamwork for them sometimes means meeting. I mean, I'm like, listen to me. What do you want me to meet about? People are hungry and people are thirsty. What else you want to meet about? <laughs> and I don't want to sound again, not, it's, it's true. When I landed first time in Marsh Harbor, I had 3,000 meals with me. I left two team members and they began doing um, inspection of what was going on. The kitchen we wanted to use in Marsh Harbor was destroyed. So we had to do plan B. Plan B was opening the kitchen in Nassau. That's what we did. But it didn't take me a week to open the kitchen. In three hours, we had the kitchen open because we had a partner, a hotel, Paradise, who already gave us the kitchen. So the only thing we did was, okay, kitchen in Nassau for, for now. Two weeks later, we opened the kitchen in Marsh Harbor. Then Nassau, we used it for the shelters in Providence. Then the kitchen in Marsh Harbor for all Abaco and the kitchen in Freeport for all Grand Bahama. So at the end, um, what we do is simple. Food and water, they cannot wait a week or a month for somebody to respond. It's the urgency of now. People are thirsty today. What, what food, maybe they can wait two days, but no more. So what we do is, who is hungry? We start going to hospitals, to the medical uh, places. We start learning what's going on, and from there we keep building. We try to uh, speed up the amount of meals we produce. You need to remember one thing. We are machines. We can do a million meals if you are in need of them. The issue is not producing. The main issue that we face problems is distribution. If you have medicines, right. you have water, you have food, but you don't have systems to distribute those goods, 
You are not providing medicines. You are not providing food, and you are not providing water. Distribution is key in emergencies. What we create is the best distribution system that anybody can create to bring relief as quick and as fast as so possible. So do some of these top-heavy organizations that you, that you can go nameless, that come in and have more meetings than you would like and take more time to, to do that, are they sitting down with you? Are they learning from you? Or are you just kind of a rogue out there and because it works for you, it works for you? And it's I don't know if they're learning from us, but we are definitely learning from them. Um, in California, we have now very good partnership with Red Cross. They're very good in running the shelters. They run them actually super nicely, very clean, very efficiently. Uh, it's nothing wrong with the men and women of Red Cross, of FEMA, of other NGOs, uh, United Nations. The people are amazing people. They have a lot of empathy. What is wrong sometimes is how the organizations are created that instead of freeing people from providing relief, change people from being effective and quick. What we are is that we adapt. We are a machine on adaptation. That's why for us, planning only to a level. Because if we plan too much, the issue is that you train your teams to plan. And when something goes wrong, and something goes as you didn't plan for, if you didn't train the teams to be adaptable, teams freeze under adversity. And what we created are teams that actually, the best of them shows up when things don't go as we plan. That's when they show the best. That's when they go into a boat and they siphon the gas and they put it in the car. This to me is the best example of what World Central Kitchen is. It's called World Central Kitchen, but I think a really important point, and your work shows this in different places that you've been, is disaster relief is food, as you say, but it's also fuel. It's also disease prevention. It's also health care. It's also all these other things. Yep. So are you, how do you wrap your arms around all of that? So for us, it's been many scenarios, like in Mozambique was cholera after the cyclone. And we were... World Central Kitchen is dealing with cholera? Yeah. Um, we had a lot of experience. I, I have science hated, don't tell me why. Um, like, um, uh, at the end of the day, restaurant kitchens, they are very well run and were very clean. And restaurant people were very trained in making sure that we do the right protocol in the way we handle food. Um, in, in Haiti, we gained a lot of experience over the last 10 years. But in Mozambique, we were running in the, ref the camps. Uh, we were running four, uh, three, four, five camps, and we had two kitchens. World Food Program was providing food in big quant quantity and scale to the villages all around Beira, in the north of Mozambique, and we took care of all the shelters. Because there was cholera, we came up with a kind of new system. We put everybody inside the truck. We make sure that they go into the truck, making sure that everything is very aseptic, that they go through bleach with their shoes. So we put them in the truck, we get inside the camps, we make sure nobody gets in contact with anybody inside the camp because we want to make sure that the camp is perfectly clean and perfect. So the most amazing thing is when we are able to finish entire operation weeks later and the camp uh, has been color free. We provide plates and some people are upset with us because we give them plastic plates because I get so upset when we give them paper plates or a styrofoam plates and then garbage peels up and garbage piles up and it's not why they're picking up the garbage. Right. At the end, what happened? Rats began arriving. Everything else ar ar began arriving. And at the end of the day, I thought, if we have sweet, uh, sweet water, we have clean water, you know who are the best fighters against cholera? Mothers. <laughs> if you give any mother clean water, I guarantee you that community will never get cholera, ever. So for me, two plans. Feed people healthy food, good food, by making sure we do it clean, and also empower the people to take care of their own. When you give people the power to take care of their own, good things happen. When we decide for them, bad things happen. So this was very important. And number two, in Bahamas, for example, we learned that 50% of the people were not grabbing the plate. And I was like, what the heck is going on? They don't like my food. I take it very <laughs> personal. They were Rastafarians. They are uh, non-meat, and at the most, they will eat fish. So 50% of our meals to Marsh Harbor and Abaco were vegetarian. And also, we had some celiac events. Even we only have sometimes only two, three people. We always bring at least one tray that is celiac. And at least in the case of Marsh Harbor, half of the food we bring was for vegetarians. So this is the things we try to cover to in emergencies. And in Puerto Rico, you got into the generator and fuel business. 
Well, we had to because we had big NGOs and big government people that were trying to bring bread and food from Florida and Georgia. And I needed bread to make sandwiches first day. We had five bakeries. So you have two people thinking, let's bring the bread from Florida in a port that is in chaos, in an airport that is overwhelmed, or steal five generators, give it to the five bakeries, and start making the bread right there in the island. When people came to me and said, Jose, it's so brilliant, guys. Why are you getting the food? I'm like, shit, in the store. <laughs> No, but don't laugh, because when I told you before that big problems have very simple solutions, I did two things when I landed in San Juan. I went to check the biggest food distributor in the island, Jose Santiago. And he told me, I'm OK, Jose. I said, good, I need a line of credit. This is my credit card, and I need a line of credit. And I said, OK. So when people were asking me where we get the food, I'm like, at the store, man, open. This is America. You give your credit card, you cheap. <laughs> and, and believe it or not, that's how we began. Um, Bahamas was not any different. Uh, we bring a lot of fruit with us. In, in, in Bahamas, in Providence, they were a little bit upset with us, I think, because we, were, we became the biggest purveyor of fruit in the island. We were buying like every single box of apples, of oranges, of pineapples, whatever was coming our way. We try to make sure that we give good food. Not because we are fancy chefs. It's but because people don't deserve anything less. We cannot be giving them MREs when you have 80, 90 year old with a lot of personal health issues. When they live uh, in a ninth floor, uh, MRE sometimes creates bigger problems than solutions. MREs occupy a lot of space. For every four MREs, we deliver 40 meals. 40. Four MREs, 40 meals. One tray, you only feed four MREs. A meal ready to eat. Military. It's, it's so military. the military portions are expensive, calorie too many, but elderly people have a high, a high problem eating that heavy packed protein. We get a lot of people sick trying to be fed. It doesn't work. So we, my MREs are sandwiches, heavy in proteins, heavy in calories, fruit. That's our MRE. Then the hot food than the salads. Um, you, you, I want to ask you a couple of particular questions, and we don't have a whole lot of time here, but you just came back from Bahamas. How's it looking there? They told me 30 minutes, and they gave us it only 25 flies, from you the know, beginning. It's why, it's, why you, it's why you get generators. You be an immigrant. You just, you just plug yourself into these generators. They took five minutes from me. <laughs> OK, OK, keep going. <laughs> What's, what, what is the Bahamas looking like? Well, Bahamas, we are in, in phase three. Uh, we are, um, I, yesterday I think we did 24,000 meals. We, we already are, uh, shelters are down to a minimum in Providence. Uh, in Abaco we are still feeding March Harbor. We barely see few stores opening over the last week. But people have no work, people have uh, no banks, no ATMs. Um, we are trying to re-engage the economy. So in some places we are helping to reopen a couple of restaurants, East Bahama. Uh, obvious, ob always we try to do it with women, so they are tiny in shack restaurants, but this is a way to start making sure that they, they make it on their own. We began buying hundreds of kitchens, so in the homes that we believe they are already okay for them to cook, we are giving them units of uh, portable kitchens, and we are giving them gas, but then we are giving them vouchers, and we are working in some communities to make sure that we open like uh, vegetable and fruit uh, uh, shops, so the economy kind of start slowly um, moving on its own. Yeah. So this is in the phase we are, and we are identifying four projects. We want to open a culinary school uh, because tourism is very big in Bahamas, and this will be a great way to start empowering young people in need of a job as Bahamas uh, these islands reconstruct. We are investing in a chicken farm that was totally destroyed. We are investing in a farm, in a vegetable farm that also was totally destroyed. And both of them, they've been working with us over the last four, five, six weeks. So as you see, our phase now is used to invest as an NGO with the hat of the private sector into businesses that they are going to keep uh, Bahamas being uh, food resilience and, and, and food independent and help the economy to start going. I have an amazing friend um, who is a surgeon, and ever since the earthquake in Haiti, he's been going down and doing surgery for free, going down for a week, two weeks, doing miracles. 
But the last time I spoke to him, he was so upset because the security situation in Haiti has deteriorated to the point where people couldn't get to this hospital and where they couldn't leave. You're in Haiti. You serve 13,000 meals or something like that in the, in the midst of this recent unrest. How are your people working down there? Are they safe? Are they able to do what you need them to do? Well, uh, we have a different project in Haiti. One is a school. We graduate 80 young Haitian women every year. I'm very happy because we were able to send some of the Haitian teams to Bahamas because there's a lot of Haitians in Bahamas and they were in the shelters. So we thought, let's make for them Haitian food. And so it was amazing to see how we are able to adapt and do foods that sometimes uh, cater to the, to the local taste of different people. So I was very proud on that. We have a kitchen in an orphanage, a restaurant, a bakery in an orphanage. We built probably the first ever in the Caribbean handicap for children ready bakery. Um, because many of the children, as they grow older, they are learning to be bakers, and so they have something to do in the orphanage. So I'm very proud of that. And we, uh, and so we have a lot of projects. We have a farm in Fonberet, uh, a honey project with uh, 42 women in the border between Dominican Republic and Haiti. So yeah, the situation in Haiti is not easy. Um, our people, as far as we know, they are safe. The real harm is happening in the streets. But I think people in Haiti, I, quite frankly, they are fed up of leadership. And what you see there is not like the people are bad, it's like the leaders are not providing the leadership they need to succeed. So one of the biggest problems we have in Haiti, and now this is a health, the future of health summit. If you really want a healthy planet, we need to start investing in the most important part that we all forget. Five million women die every year because in the process of feeding their families, they inhale the smoke. When you and I, we cook for fun on a weekend, this woman do it every single day. Who feeds humanity is no men. It's not the chefs that show up in the Michelin Guide like me on Washington Post. Who feeds humanity are women. Three billion people, three B, with a B, billion people in the planet still cook with charcoal, or wood. Quarter million years of evolution since we began using fire, these people still cook like quarter million years ago. So much getting to the moon and so much internet and web and technology and uh, Siri, uh, what's my name? <laughs> For these people, so until we don't provide every single household in, a, in the world with a clean cook stove, we will have an unhealthy planet. Women will be unhealthy. Children will be unhealthy. Young girls will not receive education because when the family is too poor to buy charcoal, who do you think they send to the forest? Women. The girls. young girls. So you can invest in the schools, I'm sorry to tell you. It's a wrong investment if you're not taking care of the kitchens because those girls will never go to school because they spend all day picking up wood and picking up water. They cut the trees, deforestation. When the rain comes, instead of penetrating the dirt, goes down the mountains, takes away the topsoil, no farming output. They're hungry. The topsoil ends in the ocean, dirty ocean, dirty water. No coral, no reef. No coral, no reef, no baby fish. No baby fish, no fishing industry. Another source of food that they miss. Until we don't provide everybody with a clean cooking like you and I, we have a home, this planet will never be healthy. This planet will never be uh, bad, poor. We need to stop the country, the, the continent, the, 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 the nation, the, the planet Earth being poor by a simple kitchen. I think we can do it, but we need to start all looking at this issue closely. Used to end, in Haiti, a family spends 25% of their salaries on charcoal. If you wake up already 25% poor, it's an equation. The energy you put out versus the energy you put in. When you put more out than you bring in, you're poor and you're hungry. A clean cook stove can save money to those families and all of a sudden the economy does better, the families do better, the mothers are healthier, the environment is better, the trees grow, the forest grows, 
the, the, the farms produce, the ocean produces, all of a sudden that clean cooking is the beginning of a better tomorrow. So I was just, I was just uh, in Rome last week, UN Food Agriculture Organization, World Food Security Conference, and the situation's gotten worse in the world. There are now 820 million people who are hungry on a daily basis. There are two billion people around the world who face food insecurity for a variety of reasons. You're now working with the UN Foundation, so you're looking globally. How do we get ahead of this? I mean, you just laid it out there, and it feels simple, but we're up against climate change, we're up against corruption, we're up, up against economic downturn, we're up against war. These are terrible things. Yeah, I mean, let me tell you. Sometimes we try to finish every problem in the world, right? But then, next to us, we have the problem. We try to solve the problems in the world, but then we don't do anything to solve what we have next to our neighborhoods. I'm at fault of that. In Anacostia, anybody has been to Anacostia lately? Only three of you. So how can we solve any problem in Anacostia? An important home for many Washingtonians, Ward 8, Ward 7, where they only have barely three supermarkets right. for almost 120,000 people. Food deserts. How do you want them to be healthy when those mothers have to walk because they don't have money for a taxi and they don't have public transportation? for over a mile, two miles, to get near a market. Try to bring fruit every day to your home for two miles. It's impossible. So what are we doing to make sure that we don't try to solve the problem in Ethiopia or anywhere else around the world, but right here in our home, three miles away from Congress? So we have a powerful farm bill, a farm bill that only serves the purpose of helping few big corporations. And I love big corporations. I want to have one. I want to be super rich. I want to be a trillionaire. <laughs> but it's hard for me to understand how we don't put at the service the big farm bill, one of the biggest bills in the history of humanity, at the service of providing simple, good food that makes America healthy, one fruit at a time. Seems, I know we call this the Future of Health Summit, but we are spending too much time in the medicines, to solve all the sickness of the world. But we know that food is the best medicine. All of the sudden, money that we are going to try to fix people can go into feed people. By feeding people, we don't have to fix them anymore. Why we don't move more money from the fixing people to the feeding people? If we do that, some of the bigger problems just go away. We're almost out of time. I want to invite you to tell a story. I realize that'll be a stretch for you. Uh, In what language? <laughs> whatever you choose. Look, um, we've, you've traveled all over the world. You've met incredible people. Um, and I'm sure there are people that you think about. There are people who inspire you. There are people who um, give you hope and faith against all these odds that we've talked about. And I just want to invite you to share one of those stories, one of those people with us, someone who's made an impression on you, who you think we could learn from just by knowing a little bit? Man, it's so many people and, and I, 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 it's so many stories, but you know one story that we need to keep telling? I, everybody knows Sean Penn? I don't think we ever gave him the credit he deserves for what he did in Port au Prince. That man became the mayor of a city almost of 100,000 people. 100,000 people that lost their home. He came in to cover the golf course of Port au Prince, and he began very much living what became one of the biggest refugee camps anywhere in the world. And that single man did it, not because he was an expert in creating a city from scratch, in providing food, in providing health, in providing clean conditions for an entire brand new city in the middle of the city. The only thing he did, you know, was, was he left the comfort of his home, he put two boots, he arrived to Port Prince, he puts the boots on the ground, and he began living. Sometimes the bigger problems, they don't have, again, very complicated solutions. The only thing we need to do is to stop less time meeting, less time planning, and use like Sean Penn, 
have boots on the ground and start changing the world one smart decision at a time. That's all what it takes. Well, I'm going to thank you for boots on the ground and gloves in the kitchen and everything you've done. And you are an inspiration and you're amazing. And you can throw out the opening game pitch anytime. Thanks. Thank you. thank you, Frank. Thank you, guys.